Welcome to the American Museum of Natural History for the opening of our fascinating new exhibition, Life at the Limits, Stories of Amazing Species. This exhibit was uh, particularly appealing for me because it, it kind of draws on a lot of what I'm currently working on, and that's deep sea organisms. Kind of another appealing thing to me about this exhibit is it focuses a lot on caves. I do, I work on cave fish in Madagascar, and what's kind of interesting about caves, people have always thought about them of these kind of evolutionary dead ends. Something falls into a cave, it doesn't evolve. Darwin even referred to the creatures in caves as wrecks of ancient life. In the exhibit, we kind of bring caves to life and show that they're not evolutionary dead ends, they're crucibles of evolution. We were very lucky that we were, we were able to include some, some of the parasitological stories in there in terms of fungi and parasitic wasps. It, it looks like something out of a science fiction novel. So what's your favorite superpower in the exhibit? The one that comes immediately to mind as a parasitologist is that a, a flea can jump 200 times its own body length because it stores so much potential energy in its legs. That's like one of us jumping to the top of one of the big bank towers in Midtown. I think for me, the one that stands out is probably the mantis shrimp. And we've got it in there because of its incredible ability to punch. It punches. Uh, clams with the force of a 22 caliber bullet so hard that water actually vaporizes, cavitates, and then snaps back with a force of, which generates light and heat. It sees 12 different colors and then three for light, and then five of those colors are actually in the ultraviolet. Each of its eyes has trinocular vision. I mean, it's, it's got all kinds of superpowers. Do they tell us anything about the possibilities of life on other planets, given what the great range of things we've seen here on Earth? The initial notions of exobiology were that we wanted to look for it on planets in other solar systems that were in that Goldilocks zone where water is liquid and where there's enough sunlight in order to create the primary productivity that we see here on Earth. We've learned from a lot of the work done in hydrothermal vents, for example, and even in caves, that light isn't absolutely necessary, that you can generate enough energy from things like hydrogen sulfide compounds. That's what happens in the hydrothermal vents. It's also supportive of, uh, you'll see in the, in the cave region, there are things called snotites, that are these bacteria that really look kind of snotty. And they're doing the same thing. They're, generate, they're using the energy that's stored in hydrogen sulfide bonds. So I think what, that kind of research does is it expands the range of possibility of where we might actually find life should we find it one day. Are all these mutations a good thing? So in general, you know, mutations are random. They happen all the time, but most of them either are do nothing for the organism or could be deleterious. You can get some extremely remarkable specializations or adaptations that organisms have that are almost too bizarre to believe. How hard is that to search an entire genome and look for these changes? There are two different ways that one goes about looking for the specific gene products that relate to uh, an extreme environment or some other behavior, some other characteristic. One is whole genome, obviously, but the other is something we call transcriptomics, where you're looking at the expressed genes and trying to figure out what you're seeing in one situation for that organism one environmental set of parameters, what, did the, what genes are being expressed, and then what are being expressed in another uh, situation, and then trying to compare those and see, well, do some of these genes relate to this really cool power? For example, being able to survive freezing. Uh, you have wood frogs and lots of other organisms produce antifreeze proteins, and we know that principally from purifying proteins, looking at transcriptomes, and I really think that's one of the stories that comes through, not just with antifreeze proteins, but for example with all of the adaptations to high altitude that we see in different mammals and birds. For example, the bar-headed goose managed to solve that because of a single point mutation in its hemoglobin, whereas Rupel's vulture in Africa that can go up to the height of, of uh, intercontinental jets it actually got, got that ability because of a gene duplication. And then humans in the Andes are able to solve that problem because they've got more red blood cells, whereas Nepalese individuals have a different mutation in their hemoglobin. So same problem, different solutions, and the connections that we're seeing to research going on right now. These are axolotls, which are used in research because they regenerate limbs very easily. All you, if you chop it off, 
they'll form a little bud and basically redo the process that the limb developed by in the first place. Parasites are kind of famed for the behavioral changes they can force upon Indeed. their host. The stories on, on parasites that we have in this exhibition, one of the, the greatest ones is the corpse flower. And that is amazing because that plant lives inside of a grapevine for its entire life until it decides to flower so you can't even see it. Then boom, flower comes out and it's the biggest flower in the world and it smells terrible. <laughs> There's an interesting story too with respect to the isopod parasite in, in fish. Okay. And this is when it lands on the fish's tongue, punches in its, its little feeding tube, starts sucking blood, eventually the tongue withers away, and then the isopod serves as a functional tongue for that fish for the rest of its life. What we're doing in this exhibition is celebrating the sheer diversity of superpowers, extremophiles, but also other forms of extremis, if you will, whether it's in sensation or in acquiring nutrition or in acquiring oxygen reproduction. And I think it's a much bigger story that can be told here because of the knowledge that we have about animal and plant biodiversity.